So I'll introduce this guy. It's uh, Dr. Stephen Lewis, and he's going to speak on the message it gives live Genesis through Revelation. That's all you get. <laughs> certainly, certainly more than I deserve, but I'll go from there. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for uh, being part of GES and the years in which we have uh, met together, and, uh, and you've all meant a lot to, to me and so many others as well. What I wanted to, what I've discovered over the years is that uh, there's a lot of debate about, uh, about what the gospel is, and uh, some of you may not even been aware that there's been controversy on that. I know. It's hard to believe. But, but the, what I've come to find out is that uh, I've shared with people so many things, and I believe that the message that we're looking at needs to be this. And so let me show you a few things as we begin. This is for Kenny. Make your weird light shine bright so that other weirdos will find you. Uh, Kenny shared with that last night where all us weirdos hang out. So uh, this, you got to make that light shine for that. The other one, this is one of my favorites. Grace, no more a license to sin. The electricity is a license to ex execute yourself. And unfortunately, that's what most people conceive of when they think about grace. Uh, the golden rule of interpretation as we look at it. Now, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin and um, ask that He would bless this time as we meet together. Father, we give You thanks today for who You are, for Your wonder and grace and mercy and justice and righteousness and all that You are. We want to take time to set aside all those things that have kind of come into our existence and kind of cluttered our lives. Help us to concentrate on who You are today. Help that each of us who uh, contribute in some way honor and lift you up in all that we do. Pray for understanding. Pray for interaction. Pray for hearts that are ready to learn, but also hearts that are ready to serve. We just thank you today that we stand in a legacy of others that have gone throughout the centuries to stand on your word. We give you thanks today in Christ's name. Amen. I've always started many times with the uh, what we would call the Golden rule of interpretation, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. I've always believed that if God chose to reveal His Word, there's something inherent in the word reveal. <laughs> He's not hiding it. He's not giving it just to a few, just to a few select, just to, an, just to a, a higher group to tell us what it is. It ought to be able to be understood either when they're hearing it uh, or when they're reading it, if they're literate, and be able to do this down through the centuries. So it's been a, a practice of mine to always remind all of us that when we come to God's Word, that is there for us to understand. And the plain sense is usually the most, most easily understood. And uh, I've always shared with my daughter, who is not a Bible scholar, she's not involved in higher education in any way, she's quite the artist and, and does a lot of other things. Uh, that as long as you, if somebody's explaining the scriptures to you and you don't understand what they're talking about, ask. I, I, I don't see that. Can you show me where that is? Can I, can I, because if she can't see it, what makes this person think that it's really there? Well, all ought to be able to see what's there. And uh, so we, we love our daughter. Our, our baby is turning 41 in a few months. <laughs> Yikes. Our son is 45 already, so I don't know how that happened. But this, I used to think this was Hindu. <laughs> Holy cow. But I now realized I've had the wrong religion all these years. It really is the way in which things are too often. I've always believed, and I've shared this in other places, and I, again, I apologize. The paper on the uh, John's Gospel for this, this dispensation is ready. But it's, it's kind of a technical paper, and I thought, you know, I really wanted to give something that I thought would really kind of gather us together. So that paper's available, and if you want to, I'll be able to email it to you. Uh, I didn't make lots of copies. It's, it's only about eight or ten pages, but, you know, a lot of footnotes and other things. So yeah, I wanted to do something that I think is very beneficial. And for me, it's been one of the most profound s studies I've ever done. I've always believed that when you when you prepare to share the message, the gospel, the message of life, that gives ever, ever, everlasting life, remember these three things. It is always, the message is always about Him, who He is, what He has done, and not about us. 
I mean, so often we t- people say, well, you know, this is what I did, da, 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 all about themselves. It's always about him. Second, it should be always simple enough for a child to understand. I cannot imagine him trying to explain to a child all the great theological terms that we have as labels. Uh, we were at, when I was at uh, what is now Corbin University as one of the deans, they had these theolog- theological theology t-shirts, and it had all these theologies, just pick off the ones that you are. You know, I can't imagine trying to explain that to a child. Yet, the free gift of everlasting life is available to children. Uh, how many have worked in Awana? Have you ever worked in Awana? Now, I know it's a little bit different today, but in years past, I would say, the rest of you who have never worked in Awana, shame on you. Because it's one of the best, had been one of the best children's program with a clear gospel message. The founders were really uh, profound about what they did with regards to the gospel message. Whether it be with Art Rohrheim, uh, uh, Bungie, or uh, Doc Latham, or others as they did that. But the third thing I think we need to remember, and this I think is a real test of how we, how we get down to the real basics, and that is it must be consistent from Genesis to Revelation. Whether we know it or not, we give the impression to most people that salvation has changed throughout the centuries. That Israel was, Israel was saved somehow in some connection with the law. Even though we don't say it, and we know they weren't saved by the law, we kind of, kind of mess things up. And Reformed theology, what they have done is they've taken the Old Testament, excuse me, the New Testament, and it made it part of the Old Testament. They insert it into the Old. Roman Catholics take the Old Testament and insert it into the New. So you can see the mixture of these things that have taken place over the centuries. But I think there's a simple way of understanding. And one of the key things I like is when I see the word that we translate gospel, I don't think of it as good news. I think of it as a good message. Because news to too many people connotates something that's new or novel. Something that's just, you know, right off the press. But it's a good message. And if we begin to start thinking in those terms, I think it will revolutionize the way we share this with other people. The way we understand it individually and the way we use it with others as well. Now, I've always thought that I'm not really not sure what to call the life that Adam and Eve possessed in the original creation. Some dispensationalists have called this innocence. I'm not sure. I don't know what to call it. But Adam and Eve did lack everlasting life after the fall. They lacked it before the fall too, but the difference is that before the fall they did not need it. That's a profound thing that's been, that we've been part of studying here. It appears that Adam and Eve started dying physically the moment they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is possible that they did not die spiritually then. If they did, that means that they had everlasting life before the fall. Then did they lose it? That becomes a problem that we have. But before the fall, Adam and Eve were not sinners and didn't have a need for everlasting life. If they had not sinned, they never would have had everlasting life, nor would they have ever died. Just some things to think about as we go past here. But once they sinned, once they disobeyed God, they put themselves in a predicament. Now they were going to die physically. If they died physically without everlasting life, then they would spend an eternity apart from God. So now they needed everlasting life. It is not that they, did, that they died spiritually when they disobeyed. It is that they became sinners when they sinned. Uh, they then sinned that they met the condition of sinlessness. After they disobeyed, they did not. And what I'm going to share with you now is, is sort of a, a chart that I developed to kind of walk you through what I think is the message of life from Genesis to Revelation. So, I have some handouts uh, that are available like this. Uh, we'll make more of them as we go uh, later on as well. Okay. I'm going to let this represent eternity. I know I thought it was a different color, and I always thought it was bigger. <laughs> but this is the only thing I could fit on the screen. So this is going to represent eternity. No, no beginning, no end. So just bear with me on that one, all right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> I want us to remember... That according to Titus 1 2 and Revelation 13 8, the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So many people have the idea that this idea of Jesus Christ going to the cross was plan B. You know, all of a sudden God's, you know, Adam and Eve disobeyed and God goes, now plan B. 
Jesus to the cross. Didn't happen that way. For, and I don't understand why, but I do understand that it says this was God's plan. Now, I'm totally, totally amazed at, a, at groups of people that say there is a secret hidden will of God, and we know it. <laughs> I've always thought, if God can't even keep a secret, how is He going to keep me secure in my everlasting life? But I find that, that kind of terminology troubling because it, it begins to say, I need to understand God, and if I can't fully understand Him and put it into terms of which I can comprehend, uh, why do I want to be with Him? I have just the opposite view. I believe if we could comprehend God, He would cease to be God. He is far beyond our comprehension, far beyond what we can ever imagine. It's far beyond my, all my trivial attempts at understanding in some menial way. And yet God is who He is. People have asked, well, what do you use as an example for the Trinity? I tell people all illustrations of the Trinity, all, do I understand the word all, end in a heresy. All of them. But pick the one you like and live with it. <laughs> pick the one to let you sleep at night and go for it. But don't begin to say, this is the illustration that perfectly examples who God is in three persons. There's nothing that exists in our finite universe and world that does that. So, we're going to let this represent. But I believe we have to understand from the very beginning the land that was slain before the foundation of the world. Okay? Now, we're going to say, and we talked a little bit about that life already. Adam and Eve had life. And we're going to start here in time. Then he's going to say, and I believe that when Adam and Eve ate for the forbidden fruit, what did God say would happen to them the day they would eat of it? They would surely die and they will die. Now, he didn't call them sinners, though they were and we are. He said they were dead. So what has man needed since then, since we're dead? Life. I've always liked the example that if I was shot with a 50, gal 50 caliber projectile, and I was, as we say here in Texas, dead, <laughs> even if they remove the bullet, what, am, what do I still remain? Dead, very good. <laughs> Catch on fast. <laughs> you see, but that, I would still need life. And when I hear all the way through with people's presentations, oh, it's sin, 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 sin. I like what Bob gave in one of his presentations. He's given so many, I forget all the different ones he's given so far. And he's only halfway done. My goodness, the guy has, what, 12 more to go. But the idea is, is that Jesus has already dealt with a sin issue. But now we have to, now what separates us is that we're dead and we need life. And Jesus Christ is the only one who can give life. So we're going to go from there and we call this, we would call this sin, you know, whatever we want to call it, or disobedience. Um, even though their sins have been dealt with as such. And that brought death. Death here, the result is that every human being is estranged from God, alienated from the life of God, Ephesians 4.18. We're alienated from that life uh, in the fall. So he tells us there that what we need is life. So, but I want us to take us clear to the end and begin to see something very profound. And that is in Revelation 20, verse 20, uh, verse 20, verse 15. At the great white throne judgment, why are people cast into the lake of fire? You know, I've, I grew up, you know, uh, my father would say, you know, son, you keep lying, you're going to hell for lying. You know, you keep doing, I won't tell you all the other things that I was doing. <laughs> Just trust me. Uh, my dad, my father was very transparent about everything. But, you know, everyone has these certain sins that people, we will not, un, not consciously sometimes, but unconsciously begin to say, you know, those are the kind of sins that will always be a problem. Those kind of sins will always separate you from God. And that, those sins will prevent you from ever having life. And you need to deal with a sin issue somehow, somewhere. But I want us to know, as you read in chapter 20, verse 15, it says, and the, the, the books were open, and then the book of life was open, and those whose names are not written in the book of life were cast in the lake of fire. And what we find there very early on is that this idea of what God is doing how that a person is cast in the lake of fire, it's not because of all the bad things that they've done. Not because of all the other things that, that they, they thought about doing, 
but clearly it was that. Unbelief is the cause for the unsaved not having everlasting life. Not having, not having everlasting life is the reason they're condemned to the lake of fire. Remember those two things are a little bit different here. Unbelief is the cause for the unsaved not having everlasting life. Not having everlasting life is the reason they're cast in the lake of fire. It doesn't say because of all the bad things that they do. Because what most of us have done in life and what most people still do in life is to compare ourselves with other people. You know, it's kind of like I'm ahead of those four people, but I'm behind these three people when it comes to where sin is in my life. And as long as I have more people behind me as in front of me, I'm fine. It's not like when a bear chases you, you don't have to be the fastest. There just has to be one person slower than you. And unfortunately, that's so many times the way we view sin. We view sin that way. Well, I, you know, I know I'm bad, but, but they're worse. So we, get us, we kind of push ourselves back up. But the Word of God tells us. And we could debate about what Gehenna is, what all these other terms are used. But when you get to Revelation 20, verse 15, it is inescapable that the whole idea is that the lake of fire is going to be in torment forever and ever and ever. And the reason that they're there is because they do not possess everlasting life. So, that's where I like to take us. So, so from the very beginning of Genesis, we see, we see that they had life. Now it brought death. We know that from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ has already been slain from the way God views it. And that at the end, the lake of fire is for those who haven't believed. Now, I, I would take you through Genesis all the way through. However, it might take longer than you might think. <laughs> What we find developed, and this is just a cursory example of how God begins to unfold for us, revealing to us who the seed is. We find very early in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, this, this great message of life that's going to defeat death, that the seed of the serpent is going to crush, is going to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. Now, now we think, well, what would, what would Adam and Eve think about this idea of a seed? What, what does that mean? Well, if we won't go to the next chapter, in chapter 4, verse 1, our next one there, we would find that, that when Cain is born, or when Cain is born, they name him Cain, and why do they name him Cain? What does that word mean? What's that name? Anybody know? I've begotten a man, God. He, Adam and Eve believed that this is the promised one. This is the one that's going to crush the head of the serpent. Now, how did that work out? <laughs> not as well as they thought. So Cain did not, was not the fulfillment of that promise. But it at least shows us that from that point on they are looking for a who that will give with the message that gives life, and that point on. So what the rest of the Old Testament does, the Hebrew Bible does, we find it reiterated in Genesis 12, telling Abraham that through his seed, through his lineage, this deliverer is going to come, the one that's going to give life. Then we know from there it's reiterated in, uh, in Genesis 22. And we, we get to Isaiah, Isaiah 9, and we think, okay, now this is really, he's going to be all of these things. This deliver. Now we could go through all the different prophecies about and all the different illustrations and all the examples who this Messiah will be, this one that gives life, all the way through the Old Testament. It's a great study in itself. Uh, but finally you come to Isaiah 9 and it's like, wow, this he's gonna be all that. And I could see Israel as they're looking forward to this deliverer that would come. And then all of a sudden Isaiah writes the end of 52 and what we call chapter 53. And he goes, and I could see Israel going, wait a minute, I thought he was going to be the deliverer. He's going to do all this. Now it tells me he's going to be a suffering lamb. And I could you know, almost see the air going out from all of the people at that moment. How could this ever take place? How could he be the king of kings and lord of lords and all of these things? And yet we're told that he's going to lay down his life as a lamb that doesn't open his mouth. So you can see the confusion. But from this side of it, we see it very simply uh, as that. But at that time, they were still looking for that deliverer. 
Finally, we get all the way through, and we know, and we can go through all of these things. We know it's a who. And then finally, we come to the place that this idea of everlasting life is there. And now we know the promised one. His name is Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? I, one of the great things that I've had the privilege of doing is knowing John, Dr. Nyamala. He has been a friend and, and a colleague, not only through seminary, but also uh, we taught together at Chafer Seminary, and we've taught together here at Rocky Mountain for these years. But his passion for the Gospel of John, you may not have noticed. <laughs> I know he hides it really, really well. But I can say this, when you look at the Gospel of John, I think as you read the first 16 verses of chapter 1, I think it's giving us sort of a, a, a picture of what all has happened since eternity past, bringing us all the way through, kind of walking us through what we just did about this promised one. And it isn't until we get to verse 17 that we now know His name. Isn't that something? He was the Word, God, Creator, Life, Light, not John, just in case someone asked. Uh, and he goes all the way through there. And finally, verse 17, we now know his name. I think that was designed to bring the reader in to ask those questions that God has already revealed in his Hebrew Bible all the way through about the promise and so on. But a brand new person who has no background in that per se can be brought up to speed in a sense about the eternality of the Logos, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, all the way through. And that begins the process because if we answer the questions of people while they're reading it, we don't allow God to use that in a way to draw them in. And I think the Gospel of John is designed to draw the reader in to go, wait a minute, what do you mean he's God and with God? I mean, this is confusing. I'm going to read more. And we could go on and on through there. By the time we get to verse 17, we know who that person is. But the idea here is at the cross, the righteous justice of God is satisfied for all humanity. I believe propitiation is the satisfaction of God's righteousness and His justice, not the satisfaction of His wrath. Personally, I think the idea of wrath is that, if we look at wrath, it's like God is like, <laughs> and finally Jesus goes across and He goes, oh, thank goodness. Now I, can, I, I no longer have to be angry. Because too many people have a concept of the God of the Hebrew Bible as we have it presented for us as nothing but an angry, vindictious, you know, somebody who's just mean and all the rest. And finally get to the, the God of the New Testament, you know, I like to think of it in my generation, you know, with a flower and a, and a, and a rifle, you know, peace, dude. He's the God of love. <laughs> but He's been a God of love all the way through. He's been the God of righteousness all the way through. He has never changed one bit. And that's why I think the message is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. God has never changed it. He's not changed. The only thing He has done is further reveal to us more and more information about this promised one who would have the message that would give life and satisfy that. And He satisfies it by the cross of Jesus Christ. I was talking with a colleague, oh, a couple of years ago, and then most recently again for some reason. And he was saying that <clears throat> Jesus' death on a cross isn't real until it's real for you. I said, I'm sorry, it sounds a lot like relativism or existentialism. And I thought, okay, this is going to stop. And he goes, I don't care if it is. That's what the Bible teaches. And I was like, well, I beg to differ with you on that one. Because when we see these passages, like has been quoted often even in this conference thus far, the idea that 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Timothy 2, 1 Peter 2, he satisfies it. Now we could also go to, and we're going to look at this idea of propitiation uh, in the next line, and that is that it's found in Isaiah 53, John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who does what? who just thinks about the best of intentions, that if you're really, really sincere and you have to catch God on a good day, you get those things taken care of. It seems to be that takes away the sin of the world. And then secondly, we can't escape 1 John 2.2, 2, clearly one of the clearest passages, not only because it doesn't, because it says not only for 
your, our sins, but the sins of the whole world. I mean, the whole way that the modifiers are there, the, the entire passage that it's in, contained in gives us no option but to somehow say, He died for all. And I've asked people, did, he, did Christ die for your past sins? Oh, yeah, yeah. Your, your, your sins now? Oh, yeah. Your future sins? Absolutely. He died for all sin. Well, no, not really. I go, so what, where do you not fit in with past, present, and future? Sometimes I'm not sure which I'm in, past, present, or future. <laughs> but outside of that, all of us fit in there. I'm always amazed, you know, when it says, for all have sinned. And I go, well, not everybody. You know, what, what part of all do we not understand? <laughs> Which sounds very similar. It depends on how, you, how the definition of is is. <laughs> all is the same way. Not only for you, our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. So I believe that this propitiation, the satisfaction of uh, God's justice and His righteousness for all sin has been dealt with. Now, some would say that leads to universalism. I don't think so. I think if, if we say Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, by acknowledging it, it gives life, or the death and resurrection gives life, and you just have to believe in that, you end up with somehow saying that if, if it only becomes true for you, but let's say it's true whether you believe it or not, then everybody then is saved. Because it already took place. If the death and, re death and resurrection is what give everybody life, then everybody has life. But it is not the belief in the death and resurrection, it's a belief in the person who are based on, or because of His death and resurrection, He can give the offer of free gift of everlasting life. And it's a marvelous thing to, to be able to, to free people up from all these other things. But I've found that most people like to use sin as an issue because they're, they believe they're at least two steps away from the last guy who's the bear's going to get. And I don't think that's a sufficient reason to hold to a theology. I think God really wants us to be clear about it. So, we'd go from there to say that, therefore, when a person comes to God through believing in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in His role as mediator bestows everlasting life on the believer, thus introducing him or her to God the Father. God, in response, accepts the believing person, pronounces him or her justified. The issue is believing in Jesus Christ for the free gift of everlasting life based on or because of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John 20, verse 30 and 31 tells us, as the only one who can give the free gift of everlasting life to those who believe, faith, trust, I don't care what word you use, it's all the same word in the original language. People say, well, no, you don't have to believe, you have to trust. I'm thinking, wow, by saying it this way, you've changed the meaning of words. <laughs> Believe, faith, trust. English, different words, and the original language in Greek, pistis, pasul, it's all the same. But people will make distinctions about this all the way through. But Him alone. This, is, this can only be a legitimate offer uh, if He is the Lord God. I have a quote, No other kind of Savior can save except a God-man. Deity and humanity must be combined in order to provide a satisfactory salvation. He must be God in order, to be, to the, in order that that death be effective for an infinite number of persons. I think that's what we have to do with it as well. So, we're really blessed to have, a, a, I think, a very simple message. I think a message that is clearly always about Him. I, I don't know of anybody that I've met in, in my, modern, my lifetime that has said, you need to believe in Jesus Christ and His death and resurrection has nothing to do with it. I don't think I've ever met anybody that said that. I've always said, we, it's always about Him. The more information you can give about Him, the more it is persuasive by the work of the Spirit that they recognize as the one that is able to give everlasting life. Our security is based upon two things. God is able to keep His promises, but the more important thing, He chooses to keep His promises. Having the ability is one thing, but choosing to do so is quite another. God Himself is the one who made the promise. And we can, we can walk this all the way through. You can make this an entire study about how God has slowly 
revealed who this seed promise is. And then finally get to the place as we do in John verse chapter 1 verse 17. We now know grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. So this is the message that we have. The free gift of everlasting life, salvation as we've called it, or justification, has always been by grace alone, in the, uh, in, through faith, grace alone, through faith alone, based upon the finished work, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, or death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, or death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. His work was the death and His resurrection proved it valid. Throughout all dispensations, no one has ever been saved any other way. Isn't that something? Again, I grew up somehow thinking that, that those people in the Old Testament, that, that, that Israel were saved somehow by doing all these things. Then when I was doing my study of the book of Hebrews that I gave that presentation a few years back, I discovered that almost all the sacrificial system had to do with unintentional sin. <laughs> Boy, that really threw me for a loop. Because I remember one time sinning intentionally. <laughs> it's either that I'm lying about the one time or it's the remembering part I may have a problem with. <laughs> but God has said to us, it is through this and no other way. Saving faith believing is being persuaded that based on His finished work, death and resurrection, <clears throat> Jesus Christ delivers from condemnation and guarantees everlasting life to all who simply believe in Him. Is this something we can share with a child? Can a child respond? I, well, I grew up uh, in, in one church until the fourth grade, a Pentecostal church, of which people went forward <laughs> every week again and again and again. Then I, would, then I moved to Southern California and went to a Southern Baptist church. Now we had an invitation every Sunday again. I was the only one who went forward multiple times. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, I've told people, I said as a youth we were kind of, kind of mean spirited and we'd say, you know, if, it's, uh, it was my turn last week to go forward because if they sing 25 more verses of Just As I Am, you know, we're all going to run out of here with our hair on fire. But we didn't. <clears throat> but the idea is, is that there was a young girl that went, went forward uh, one of those invitations, and she was probably about four or five, and, uh, and she was a, just a little bitty girl, and the pastor at that time was about my size that I am now, maybe thinner. <laughs> anyway, he looked down at this little girl, and he, I mean, just loomed over and said, now, now, Tiffany, do you realize that you're a really bad sinner? And she looked up, and she goes, well, well, no. And so... <laughs> What he did is he said, he called for her father and said, would you come and take her? When she recognizes what a bad sinner she is, we'll talk. Now, fortunately, I know this young lady. She's in her 50s now. <laughs> but she is a believer. But not because of what this pastor taught, but because someone else finally gave her the correct message. And I think we, we do a disservice to people when these things occur. We have a tendency to use it as a way, more or less, to not only control, but to do other things as well. So, concluding principles, if you will. Our salvation, past, present, and future is protected by the power of God. If you have ever believed in Jesus Christ for everlasting life, here's a news flash. You have everlasting life. <clears throat> I've always said to people, uh, John 3.16 and John 6. Uh, 47 and all the other verses we may use all give us the idea that the one time you believe you have everlasting life and inherent in the term everlasting is what? It's going to last. It's forever. And I'm thinking so what is it that we we're do? But people will use the other ways to control others to be able to say you need to do this, you need to do that. And if I'm the pastor the one thing I want people to do a lot of is giving. Mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> but, is, but, but people have attached all kinds of other things as a way to manipulate, to control, to make people do the right thing. Uh, if I tell people they're under grace, they'll just live the way they are. They'll just live all kinds of ways. So I need to tell them that they need to live this way or else. And I've found some of the most legalistic grace people in the world that hold to a grace gospel. 
But they still will have this idea, I can't let them decide on their own. They have to have somebody else oversee this for them. And God elected me to be the overseer to make sure they do those things. <laughs> Don't get me started, brother. We're going to be here all day. But it is, it is the nature of our being to want to help God out. And God doesn't need our help. What he wants is obedience all the way through. Jesus Christ was obedient even to the cross. You know, I love that Philippians 2 passage, even though I'm still working on what that really is saying. I mean, it's profound that he humbled himself even to the point of a servant, but a servant that would die. That is a marvelous message that we have all the way through. We should, as I say here, should persevere on our faith and good works, as Ephesians 2.10 says, but it is not necessary to possess everlasting life. A great, simple message that we have. Any questions, comments? Thank you. Goodbye. So, questions, pass them forward. Bob and I have already agreed, only slow pit softball at this point. <laughs> Brother, while you're getting ready to do this on your slide, which you showed the plan, yeah. I didn't get the scripture on the lower side. Okay. It's too fuzzy for me. That's you okay. That's okay. Let me put it back up so we have it up as well. Yeah, it'll be on the printout. But here, uh, the passage on the bottom side there uh, is uh, John 20, verse 30 and 31. This is where I, I have down there as well. Uh, and then I have the quote is from uh, Ryrie's Balancing the Christian Life, page 175 for the other quote. So... Okay. Start with these. <laughs> My pastor often says that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, but you have to ask for forgiveness. How would you suggest I approach this, uh, approach him about this? Uh, I think there is a sense in which uh, most of us, when we when we realize that we really are dead because of our trespasses and sin and that Christ died for that. There, there's probably a sorrow, but sorrow is not necessary. I mean, you know, I would say if we took a, a, a poll of how each person felt before they became a believer and the moment after, it would vary as there are people here. So the idea of what takes place, I, I would say as believers <coughs> that are not, for people that aren't in a relationship with God, forgiveness all day long isn't going to do anything. The only people that can seek forgiveness are those that are already in a relationship with Him. And therefore, that's why He only disciplines His own children. You know, that's what Hebrews says. That's what, so all the way through Scripture, He only disciplines His own children. He doesn't, but as much as we'd like to discipline our neighbor's kids, don't we? Shh, this isn't on tape. So, but you can only discipline your own. And God disciplines His own children. And if we disobey and we, we end to sin, He asks us to come to a place of confession. Personally, my, my impression is, is that when we begin to think of, of asking for forgiveness, I think of that as somewhat presumptuous. I think when I recognize that, I, that God brings to my mind that I am sinning, my first thought ought not to be, God, just let, please forgive me for that one. I think He wants me to think about it and realize that I have offended Him. And confession is what He asks. He does the forgiving. I told somebody in 1 John 1 9, you know, if we confess our sins, you know, He's faithful and just forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I tell people it's like I took my jacket in because I spilled taco sauce on it. Hard to believe, I know. Yeah, right. I got the coat back and the cleaner said, by the way, you also sat in cat hair. You didn't know it, but I cleaned that. But that which you told me about, I cleaned it. I think if we realized all the things that we do as believers that are offensive to God, we'd die in a pile. 
But instead, he says, those things that, he, that we are now become more sensitive to, I confess. And then again, I think God desires that we stop doing some of those stupid things. Yeah. I mean, it's like, hello? Don't we want our children? I know my parents wanted me to stop doing stupid things. Right. Boy, was that a foolish errand. <laughs> When I joined the Navy, I left a note for my mother and father. I'll, I'll call you. And when I got to boot camp, I sent a letter home and said, Mom, if you don't hear from me, I'm okay. But we're not allowed to write home. <laughs> I thought it was a very good idea. The chief came in. He said, Lewis, you're going to write your mother every day and give me the letter and we're going to mail it. Because my mother met my best friend's mother and said, well, how's Mel doing? Oh, fine. He writes all the time. <laughs> my mother says, well, how does he get to write and Stephen doesn't get to write? So I had to write. So trust me, if it comes to confessing sin, I've got lists of it. But God wants me to stop doing some of those things. Remember Ephesians 2.10, good works that we should walk in them. The more you occupy yourself with the things of God, the less time and energy you have for doing the other things. I'm just, it's just an easy equation. You know, but if I fill my time with other things, I'm going to get there. So when, I, when he asks for forgiveness, I don't think that's what gives us everlasting life. Now, if the, what they mean by that is... You know, I, I need to be forgiven uh, of, my, of my bad decisions. And, my, and now I'm being persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That He's the one that gives me everlasting life because of a death and resurrection. I guess you could redefine things, but I don't think forgiveness is really the best way to go. Okay. And let's see. How is John 1.29? Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world related to the theme of belief in the Gospel of John. I think, and as I've said a little bit of, I think the idea of behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is foretelling us how God is going to accomplish that promise He made in Genesis. All the way through, and it sets a stage for the reader of John to recognize very early on that the death and resurrection is going to be vital to the procurement of everlasting life. See, because the cross and resurrection is not only a sign of one of the eight signs in the Gospel of John that, a, that by understanding it can bring you to saving faith. But there's also the basis for which all offers of everlasting life have ever been made. So it's both the basis of as well as the, uh, one of the examples of G Jesus Christ showing who He is as the one who can give life. So I see it critical to it, not, not a tangent at all. Okay. What is the difference between life and everlasting life? Well, I think Bob did a great job of that, showing that in, in, the, in the Gospel of John and other places, the idea of life and everlasting life are sometimes used synonymously because of the context. And uh, like anything else, like the golden rule of interpretation, context is what, the, what rules the t meaning of words. Terms only have meaning in context. The example I give to all of our students is the term trunk. To what am I referring? There are a lot of options. <clears throat> and interpretation and hermeneutics and Bible study is narrowing down the options and hopefully down to one and only one that will fit in that context. I remember growing up people said, oh, I have the Amplified Bible and it tells me all the synonyms for that word. <laughs> well, not all those choices probably would overwhelm most people if they understood that they're not all true synonyms, they're just all the ways that term is used, or the, what we call the, the semantic range of that term, but only in context do we find that term defined. Uh, we would call synchronic word studies the best way to do those kinds of things. So I think Adam and Eve, uh, excuse me, life and death is there. When God created Adam and Eve, uh, they don't have God what, do they don't have God's life? I don't know. That's why I said I, it's a work in progress for me. I'm not really certain about what to call that. But I, but I can go by exactly what occurred. That when God said the day you shall surely die. And at the same time they still needed, a lot, they still needed the gift of everlasting life. No one on this planet has ever lived that hasn't had the need of everlasting life. No one. You know, not even our moms. Honest. <laughs> What does the lack of eternal life mean? It means you lack eternal life. <laughs> I don't know. 
But I mean, I, I would say if a person doesn't have everlasting life, they don't have everlasting life. That's all. I mean, they are, all, they are already, and again, we looked at the lake of fire. You know, what is it that, that people, why are they cast in there? It's because they don't possess everlasting life. They don't have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. I did a study a few years back here about the different books. The books, you know, the book of life. The you know, book of the living, which is different than the book of life. There's all these other phrases that to do, and I would just go for that there as well. Okay. Uh, would you please explain Acts 10.43 in light of your presentation? Okay. Remind me, what does Acts 10.43 say? My mind is... What's that? Cornelius. Wasn't he on Soul Train? Okay. 1043. Well, I think, I think the idea of um, the remission, oh, let me read it for you. I'm reading from the New King James. Uh, talking about to, preaching to Cornelius' household. Uh, to him all the all uh, back up and uh, verse 42. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who is ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins or forgiveness of sins. Uh, yeah, I would, no, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, I would say that was exactly right. I think we have to look at it in the sense of what God has been doing uh, and what He is pr proclaiming here, the, the idea of being delivered from, and uh, I don't know, keep, keep working on it. Good question. I think forgiveness is a plot. Uh, the idea of satisfying the justice of God is not the same as receiving the forgiveness of it. I don't think he, I think in the sense that he has paid the payment for it, uh, but yet there are still things, you know, people say, you know, we don't want to say, well, the moment you believe in Jesus Christ and have the free gift of everlasting life, <clears throat> all the things you've ever done are now wiped clean. If I'm still serving a, you know, a term in prison, guess what? They're not going to let me out. I just have to pay the payment, for, pay the penalty for that. But the idea of what, what forgiveness is, I think it is, uh, uh, we have to deal with that taken care of. It's not a, not, we don't get away with everything. But yet our eternal destiny is taken care of. And I think that's a great part about it. There was a story that was told years ago of a, a little boy. <clears throat> and every time the boy did something wrong, the father would put a nail in this, this barn door. And every time he, he repented of that and sought forgiveness, God, and the father would pull out the nail. But yet over the years, what does he still have? A barn full of nail holes. Well, mine still has a lot of nails in it, but that's another thing. <laughs> All together. Uh, does the cross forgive sins? No, I, I think it takes care of the penalty of it uh, as such. And I would look at that as the primary object, primary focus of what God is doing at the cross. But the cross is essential. I mean, people that say, I, I, I've never known anybody that doesn't somehow explain the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, in any presentation because it's about Him. Uh, people have said the best way to, to minister, to share, pe share with people the free gift of everlasting life is to share your testimony of where you've been. Well, then it almost gives the idea that they have to follow in the exact same footsteps uh, as that. And I don't think that's exactly what we mean to say by that, but it ends up being there. Uh, you have shown that the Old Testament gave information about the coming one and what he would do. But where would one have seen in the light... What one have seen in the life, in the Old Testament, that life was available through faith in Him. Well, I think all the way through, he would, we find the idea that uh, b believing that one, they, they must have had some concept of it because Job understands about the resurrection. Others have done this and always by faith, you know, that they believed these things. And that's the only thing I would say. Is there gospel invitations the way we use the good message invitation in the Old Testament? Not, not as explicit as in the New. But Israel understood it as such. Good. Uh, We're on demo time? Okay. Good. You're very welcome. 
Thank you.